I'm Brenda Trombley with Classical 91.5. So pleased to see you, Mimi Huang. Thanks for joining us and making time. Thank you for having me, Brenda. Tell us about growing up in LA. What were your parents like? Well, my parents came to this country um, in the early 50s and they met at a foreign student's Valentine's Day dance at USC. And uh, my mom was wearing a traditional Chinese dress and, and she had only been in the country for about a month. And my parents met then and they've been, they were together ever since, you know, after that. And they got married in 1955. And um, my mom was a pianist. She came to study piano at USC and studied with John Crown and Rosa Rosanna Levine. And my father was studying international relations and he went on to do other things after that. But the first thing that they did after they got married is together is they owned a laundromat near USC. And so when we were in LA, when I would go to LA to visit my parents, we'd often drive by my, and both of my children went to USC. So we were in that neighborhood a lot. So we'd also, my mom would always point out where the laundromat was. Um, but my father went on to start um, to found the first federally charted Chinese American bank um, with, and started in LA with just one office. And he, he really felt like he wanted to make other immigrants' dreams come true, like he did. So he knew that, it, that if you were an immigrant, you couldn't walk into a, a bank and get a, a traditional business loan. That, but he felt like he could tell if somebody walked into a bank, uh, and a Chinese immigrant, and he could tell by shaking their hand whether that that person was honest or trustworthy or not. So he really helped a lot of immigrants um, fulfill their American dream like he did. He sounds um, like a really compassionate person. He was. He, he was kind of a character. He sort of, he, uh, though my, you know, of that generation, my parents were actually pretty progressive for, you know, immigrant parents. Um, they, they really wanted, my father really wanted us to be uh, Americans. My father grew up in Shanghai and he grew up um, watching American movies and thinking that the streets here are paved with gold. And so that was his dream to always to come to America. And he really fulfilled his dream. Um, my parents were, you know, they, they weren't as strict as a lot of immigrant parents were and are, you know, um, my siblings and I, we married, we married non-Chinese people and, uh, we went into a little, you know, um, sort of alternative, um, not so traditional, um, not very traditional uh, career paths. Um, my brother is, is a playwright. My brother is the writer, David Henry Huang. And um, which is especially in those days to have your son become a playwright, <laughs> uh, your, your Chinese son. And, um, you know, I think it was easier for me to be a musician because um, I was a girl. You know, so I think if I were a son, I think it, I, I think being a musician would be much more uh, looked looked down upon in in those days. Um, but I really had more of a tiger dad than a tiger mom. So they started uh, you out early on cello, right? At eight. Uh, yeah, I started. Well, I started piano when I was four four because my mom was a pianist, and that didn't go so well. Um, and so I switched to cello when I was eight, and and. Uh, I've been playing the cello ever since then. I understand there was a roller skating accident that kind of steered you in a certain direction. Tell us that story. Well, when I was, I think I must have been nine or ten, and and I was a pretty active. I was this really sporty kid. I was, you know, always out, you know, uh, throwing the ball or something like that. And I had fallen when I was roller skating and did something to my elbow. And I went into my cello teacher, who was. Um, uh, a Russian Polish woman. I, they studied with the cellist Eleanor Schoenfeld, and I studied with her for 10 years growing up. And she was very strict, you know, Eastern European kind of tradition. And she sat me down and said that I needed to choose between roller skating or the cello at age nine or 10. <laughs> so I, you know, from then on, I just really didn't tell her when I was out in the street playing football with my cousins. Um, and I just <laughs> took care of myself, so I didn't hurt myself after that. But um, I, I, I studied with this very strict cello teacher um, for these 10 years. And soon after I started um, playing the cello, I was seeing her three times a week. I would go and have two lessons a week plus chamber music. And so I did that for about 10 years and let, until I left to go to college. So it was pretty intense <laughs> the whole time. Now you moved to Rochester as an adult. Uh, what was that like? Relocating? I did, but well, I first um, 
came to Rochester actually as an undergraduate. I did my first under, two undergraduate years at Eastman. And um, I was not super happy here. Um, you know, I'd come from LA and I was really a Valley girl coming to Rochester. I didn't own, I didn't own a winter coat. Um, when we arrived here, my mother took me down to Sibley's on Main Street and bought me a couple of wool sweaters. And, uh, you know, I had a little kind of cute ski jacket and somebody said to me, oh, you're gonna need to get more jacket than that. You know, that's, and I had a little cute little thing. Um, and so, um, and then I moved back to Rochester. So I only stayed here for about two years and I transferred to another school after that. But I came back to Rochester in the early 90s and I've been living here ever since. And I, I love living in Rochester. So I'm actually a firm believer in not knowing the future because I don't think we're ready to know what our future holds for us. And if you would have told me as a 17 year old girl that I'd be living here as an adult and you know, being married and raising a family and teaching at Eastman, I don't think I would have been happy with that scenario, but I'm actually very happy with that scenario, so. That's my story about Rochester. I love living in Rochester. I think this is a great place. Well, congratulations on all your amazing work and being named uh, the chair of the board of directors of Chamber Music America. Thank That's you. really exciting. What has this last year been like for you in terms of your musical life and playing chamber music? Um, there hasn't been a lot of chamber music playing. Um, you know, uh, last summer, uh, my quartet, the uh, Amanda Quartet, we started rehearsing in my garage. So, you know, I cleaned up my I have a pretty big garage. So I cleaned it out and we all spaced out and we sat in four different corners of the garage. And, um, and so, you know, we realized we couldn't hear each other very well. So we got a little bit closer and we, of course, wearing masks and everything. And we did one garage concert at, um, for, uh, at a friend's house where we played in the garage and they sat in the driveway. We invited a few friends and they set up chairs. Um, but I really have not done very much playing ch of chamber music at all since until about a couple of weeks ago. So it's been a very, very weird year like that. Um, there's been chamber music going on at Eastman. Of course, I've been teaching chamber music uh, under pretty strict uh, protocols. You know, we can't meet for more than an hour and everybody has to sit distant and with masks and we have to be in the larger classrooms. We can't be in our studios. Um, just to be safe. And it's really gone pretty well. The, the kids have done great. They're, they're so inspiring. They, the ones that have come back have just really wanted to play so badly. And they're very committed to, to their chamber music groups. And it's been very inspiring. My one, cha I, I uh, run the graduate chamber music seminar at Eastman. And those kids have been great all year. Some of the best classes I've had. And usually I have auditions and I put, to, put together groups but I wasn't even allowed to have auditions for those classes this year because we're trying to cut down on contact. So the kids put the groups together themselves and they've all been great. They've been really wonderful. So that's been, that's been really inspiring. It's been nice to just have uh, chamber music all in the same room together because I've also been coaching chamber music online, which is um, really a challenge because it's hard enough to play together in the, when you're all in the same room but when you're spread out all over the world over Zoom, <laughs> it's it's really impossible. Um, so we've had to think of other ways of of ha of giving these kids a chamber music experience without actually playing together. What are you hearing from your colleagues around the country in terms of how they hope to come out of this pandemic and what plans they might have to play? Uh, it, it, will things be different? Do you think? Well, I think. Um, I hope some things will be different. Um, you know, um, touring chamber ensembles have always struggled with, um, you know, the basic fee structure is that you get a concert in somewhere, you get a flat fee and you pay for all your expenses yourself, which means once you pay for your own, ex you know, your airfare and your meals and travel and everything, and you pay your agent and blah, blah. That means you, when you come home, you don't really come home with very much money. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm hoping that this will be a time to, as a reset and that there'll be um, some kind of more discussion about hub bookings so that people are not traveling so much and having to get on a plane for every single concert. Um, and so it just gets to be a, a, a more advantageous economical situation for, for chamber groups. Um, I think I think most of us have started playing with 
some other people and it's really great. Um, and I've got, I've played two concerts in the last two weeks and it's been super fun. And I have a performance at, uh, for live at Hochstein on Wednesday. So that's been amazing. It's been really amazing. It's, it's, you know, it was a long time off and <laughs> it's hard to get back when you've been off for a while, but it's, it's been, um, fun and inspiring to do all of that. Have you had any revelations about yourself or the role of music in your life or your relationship with your cello? Or has it been like everyone sort of survival day to day in the last year? No, I think that, you know, like everyone, you, um, you know, we've all had a time to, to be quiet with ourselves and to think about what's really essential in our lives. And maybe things that we don't want to add back in our lives after not having that um, for a while. Um, I, I have, don't feel like there's a lot that I want to get rid of that, that I, I, that I don't feel like that there's a lot that I don't want to put back in my life from before. So I kind of feel lucky in that way. I think I was, I was doing pretty well in figuring out what I wanted to do. Um, but I think a lot of people are thinking about, you know, people that are a little bit on the older side thinking, you know, how much longer do I want to do this? You know, this hurts, this hurt, you know, all the aches and pains from all the repetitive, you know, use from playing. And I think everybody has kind of a different experience and it's been very interesting. It has been interesting. It certainly has been an interesting year in terms of uh, social justice and our awareness of the strengths and weaknesses of our own country. And I wanted to ask your thoughts. Um, recently, the Senate approved measures to shore up support for law enforcement efforts to protect Asian Americans and those of Pacific Island heritage. And I'm wondering, Mimi, what you have seen and what your thoughts are about uh, this past year. Well, it's been, I think the events of this past year have been sobering. Um, they've been troubling. Um, and, but I've also take, I've taken this opportunity to do a lot of reading and thinking about how I can be different. Um, I, I feel inspired to see, seeing the activism by young people. You know, it's kind of not the way I was raised. I was raised more in a kind of the traditional, you know, Asian way of, you know, you stick, you know, mind your own business, you know, don't get in trouble, you know, be a good kid. And I'm really inspired by seeing the activism in young people, all kinds of young people. And, but I think especially a lot of Asian American young people, and they're, they're not afraid to speak up and, and they want to be heard. And I, I find that very inspiring. It makes me want to be better about that, about speaking up more. What are um, some, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask if there were lessons that you learned from your own parents that have kind of carried you through this past year. Well, my dad was, you know, my dad was a trailblazer. He, he, he was not afraid to be the first Chinese person in the country club. You know, he, he thought he always said, and he said this with complete sincerity that he said, uh, they don't like Chinese people because they don't know any Chinese people. I said, once they get to know me, they'll love me. He was very confident about it. And, you know, I don't know that I have that trailblazing spirit that my father did, but he, he was not afraid of things. He was at his best really when his back was against the wall. And um, I think that kind of perseverance and that kind of grit from my parents, I think is something that has really um, been dear to me. And um, I lost my mother about two years ago. So mm -hmm. it, it, it makes things a little bit, you know, you think about your parents slightly, in a slightly mm -hmm. different way when they're no longer here. Um, but, you know, but my, my parents were great. They, they um, you know, followed us around the world coming to concerts and going to my brother's play openings and they were so proud of us and they, they loved every minute of it. And we used to tease them that they would go to an opening of an envelope. 
<laughs> That's yeah, they wonderful. Were, they were they were incredibly supportive parents. So. Well, I want to double back to a story that you told about your father, that he had this sense that he could size people up by their handshake and looking them in the eye. Did that ever backfire on him? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure it did. But he, but he kept going. He was an incredibly positive and uh, entrepreneurial free spirit. And um, he made friends with a lot of people. Um, and built a lot of bridges actually through food. He would invite a lot of his clients to these big to his Chinese banquets in Chinatown and, and in Monterey Park in LA. Um, and he would order for them. And, and so he built a lot of bridges that way through food. And um, I love food. <laughs> and I think that's something that I've, I've adopted also. I love having people to my house. I don't have the nice Chinese food in here in Rochester that that we do in LA, but um, he was, he did, he did a great job at winning people over. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Brenda. Mimi Huang is chair of the board of directors of Chamber Music America, professor at the Eastman School of Music. I'm Brenda Tremblay, WXXI FM, Classical 91.5.